for Halifax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I've really enjoyed my time in the House this afternoon, uh, particularly listening to the speech of my colleague from Abitibi to Miskaming, and he may want to know uh, that I actually received an email from one of my constituents who's at home watching the debate on CPAC uh, and said that the member from Abitibi to Miskaming was very refreshing and it was nice to see someone speaking in the House on this issue that actually made some sense. So congratulations to him. Besides you. Besides me, of course. <laughs> Um, and he went over a lot of the numbers um, already, and I, I know I'm going to repeat some of them, but they bear repeating, Mr. Speaker, absolutely they bear repeating, especially when you have Don Head, who came and testified at committee. He's the Commissioner of Correctional Service Canada. So he's not, he's not a partisan, he's not working for, for us or for the Bloc or for the Conservatives. He is there as the Commissioner of the Correctional Service of Canada. And he said that as of 2010, in October, there were 1,508 offenders with cases applicable for judicial review. So here are some of the numbers that he brought to committee. Since the first judicial review hearing in 1987, there have been a total of 181 court decisions. And of those 181, 146 of the court decisions resulted in a reduction of a period that must be served before parole eligibility. 35 of them ended in a refusal. So since 1987, we've only had 146. That's about six a year. And to put things in context, since 1987, of the literally thousands of offenders who were eligible for parole early, only 181 have applied. Of those 181, uh, 135 receive reduc reduction in their sentence. Less than 15%, this is really important, less than 15% of the people who are incarcerated with no eligibility of parole for 25 years have even made the application. Less than 15% even made that application. In addition, most applications do not commence at the 15-year mark. In fact, most of them start at the 17 or 18-year mark. So those are some of the numbers, Mr. Speaker. And as you can see, it's not great hordes of, of inmates who are using this as a loophole or a get-out-of-jail car, free card. Not at all. They're serving their sentence. Some are applying. Some are being approved. And, consequently, some are being rejected. Like any good system uh, or any good process for decision-making, the system is not broken. But something that the numbers don't show, and if there is time, I'll get back to the numbers, but something that they don't show is the fact that the faint hope clause, what's its purpose? Well, it increases the safety of fellow inmates. It increases the safety of workers. It makes our federal prisons uh, a better place to be where people actually are engaging in good behavior and, more importantly, rehabilitative behavior. It promotes good behavior because it holds out faint hope, which is exactly the point. Imagine if, if you were convicted of murder. It doesn't actually matter, frankly, whether or not you committed the murder. If you were convicted of murder, why would you comply with treatment? Why, why would you listen to guards? Why would you listen to your doctor about what kind of uh, treatment you needed or what kind of programs you needed? A 25-year sentence, and you're there for 25 years. There is absolutely no reason why you should engage in good behavior. There's no reason why you should engage with rehabilitation programs. There's none. Faint hope holds out exactly that. Faint hope. Addiction counseling, anger management, mental health supports, why would you even bother engaging with that stuff when you know you're there for 25 years and there is no hope? There's no reason to get along with fellow inmates because there's no chance, there's no hope. There's no reason for good behavior because good behavior won't actually help you. And it's not just about good behavior, like I said, it's also about rehabilitation. And if that's, that's the case, why would, you, why would you engage in the rehabilitation process? So if that is what's happening, if there's no reason to be involved, then we have to own up to the fact that when we're releasing uh, inmates after they've served their time, they aren't necessarily rehabilitated. There's a, a huge flaw in the thinking there that this is a good, this is sound public policy. It doesn't make any sense. Mr. Speaker, we see that this government time and time again on crime and punishment issues, they're taking their cues from the U.S. 
They're taking their cues from the failed policies of the United States. More prisons, three strikes you're out, mandatory minimums, and in particular, mandatory minimums with drug offenses, which we've seen the evidence just don't work. I sat there at committee, at the Justice Committee, and I listened to testimony about mandatory minimums on drug offenses over and over and over again. We see that they don't work, and we see that, in fact, um, Policymakers in the United States are retreating from that line of thinking, but here we are following them when we know it's not working, when we know that what works is the four pillars approach, right? So looking at harm reduction, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. That's what we know works, but instead we're going to do something that's outdated and has been proven not to work. I sat through testimony at Justice Committee showing that it doesn't work, but yet still we have a government that says, yeah, that's a great idea. We're going to go ahead with it. We're going to follow failed policies. It's not about what's working, clearly. It's not about what doesn't work. What, it, what this government is about is ideology. That's what it's about, is ideology. So, for those of us who don't ascribe to that ideology, do we give up hope? Does this ideology mean that the Conservatives will never see reason, that they'll never be reasonable? Well, interestingly, I don't think that's what that means necessarily because we heard earlier from some other, some of my colleagues that Newt Gingrich, if you can believe it, he recently wrote an article with Pat Nolan about this issue. I think it was the Washington Post, um, January 7th, 2011. If Newt Gingrich can come around, surely to goodness these guys can come around. And, and this letter is, it's remarkable, Mr. Speaker. That's plain and simple, it's remarkable. And I want to read from it because I think, I, Anybody who's listening at home, my colleagues here, I think you'll be so surprised. So here we are, Friday, uh, January 27, 2011, and uh, the article writes, with nearly all 50 states facing budget deficits, it's time to end business as usual in state capitals and for legislators to think and act with courage and creativity. We urge conservative legislators to lead the way in addressing an issue often considered off limits to reform, prisons. Several states have recently shown that they can save on costs without compromising public safety by intelligently reducing their prison populations. Emphasis mine. We joined with other conservative leaders last month to announce the Right on Crime campaign, a national movement urging states to make sensible and proven reforms to our criminal justice system. Policies that will cut prison costs while keeping the public safe. Among the prominent signatories are Reagan Administration Attorney General Ed Meese, former drug czar Asa Hutchison, David Keene of the American Conservative Union, John DeLulio of the University of Pennsylvania, Grover Norquist of the Americans for Tax Reform, and Richard Viguri of conservativehq.com. We all agree that we can keep the public safe while spending fewer tax dollars if we spend them more effectively. The Right on Crime campaign represents a seismic shift in the legislative landscape and it opens the way for a common sense left-right agreement on an issue that has kept the parties apart for decades. See, Mr. Speaker, they're doing it in the U.S. They're reaching across the House, they're working on issues together. And I'll continue. Quote, there is an urgent need to address the astronomical growth in the prison population with its, with its huge costs and dollars and lost human potential. We spent $68 billion in 2010 on corrections, 300% more than 25 years ago. The prison population is growing 13 times faster than the general population. These facts should trouble every American. Our prisons might be worth the current cost if the recidivism rate were not so high, but according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, half of the prisoners released this year are expected to be back in prison within three years. If our prison policies are failing half of the time and we know there are more humane, effective alternatives, it is time to fundamentally rethink how we treat and rehabilitate, rehabilitate our prisoners. We can no longer afford business as usual with prisons. The criminal justice system is broken and conservatives must lead the way in fixing it. Several states have shown that it is possible to cut costs while keeping the public safe. Consider events in Texas, which is known to be tough on crime. Conservative Republicans joined with Democrats in adopting incentive-based funding to strengthen the state's probation system in 2005. Then in 2007, they decided against building more prisons and instead opted to enhance proven community corrections approaches such as drug courts. 
The reforms are forecast to save $2 billion in prison costs over five years. And you'll note, Mr. Speaker, we're going to build more prisons. Quote, the Lone Star State has already redirected much of the money saved into community treatment for the mentally ill and low-level drug addicts. Not only have these reforms reduced Texas's prison population, helping to close the state budget gap, but for the first time, there is no waiting list for drug treatment in the state. And crime has dropped 10% from 2004, the year before the reforms, through 2009, according to the latest figures available, reaching its lowest annual rate since 1973. Last year, we both endorsed corrections reforms in South Carolina that will reserve costly prison beds for dangerous criminals while punishing low-risk offenders through lower-cost community supervision. Aha! The legislation was a bipartisan effort with strong support from liberals, conservatives, law enforcement, the judges, and reform advocates. The state is expected to save $175 million in prison construction this year and $60 million in operating costs over the next several years. Some people attribute the nation's recent drop in crime to more people being locked up, but the facts show otherwise. While crime fell in nearly every state over the past seven years, some of those with the largest reductions in crimes have also lowered their prison population. Compare Florida and New York. Over the past seven years, Florida's incarceration rate has increased 16%, while New York's decreased 16%. Yet the crime rate in New York has fallen twice as much as Florida's. Put another way, although New York spent less on its prisons, it delivered better public safety. Americans need to know that we can reform our prison system to cost less and keep the public safe. We hope conservative leaders across the country will join us in getting it right on crime. And Mr. Speaker, I can barely believe that I just stood up in this house and read something written by Newt Gingrich. <laughs> and I'm holding it forward as a sound public policy, but it is so much more sound than what, what it is that this conservative government is doing. It's absolutely remarkable to me. I mean, okay, <laughs> time and time again, the NDP has stood up in this house and said, it's not about tough on crime, it's about smart on crime. I mean, I've, I've, I've heard my colleague from Elmwood Transcona many times say smart on crime. Uh, our justice critic, the member from Windsor Tecumseh, always he's talking about smart on crime. And our public safety cr critic, the member from Vancouver Kingsway, smart on crime. You have to be smart on crime. And here we have Newt Gingrich saying we have to be right on crime. I mean, that's exactly, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's unbelievable. Ah, yeah, he's right on crime. <laughs> um, I'd like to go back to some of the testimony at committee, at the Justice Committee, in particular the testimony of uh, Don Head. He talks about the um, Correctional Service of Canada and how it supports the judicial review process. And um, he does say that, you know, CSC supports judicial review process that's governed by a particular directive. And he says that 12 months before the offender's judicial review eligibility date, the, the institutional parole officer would meet with an offender to determine whether he or she did, is planning to submit an application. And then the staff would advise the offender at that time of their responsibility to actually engage with legal counsel. So the staff of Correction, Serv uh, Correction Services Canada also works with the offender to facilitate a transfer um, to the jurisdiction where the hearing would be heard if, if the uh, offender actually requests a move. Next in the process, um, staff would advise the inmate to request access to their file through access to information so that they can actually share that information with their legal counsel. And then the, the staff, the primary worker or the parole, internal parole officer, works to ensure that a psychiatric and or a psychological assessment is completed in the 12 months leading up to the application, as well as um, a judicial review report. Makes good sense to me. So the judicial review uh, report follows the form um, that they use to determine parole eligibility, and it covers six different areas. The offender's social, family, and criminal background, sentence administration dates, summary of transfers and any disciplinary actions, summary of the offender's performance and conduct, any assessments done by psychiatrists, psychologists or elders, and finally the offender's personal development. So you can see 
what I was talking about earlier about these incentives, the faint hope clause being an incentive for good behavior, but also being an incentive to actually engage with rehabilitation services, you can see it's right there in the judicial review report. So of course you, you want to make sure you've got all the boxes ticked, that, you've, that you have a, a good record, that you've completed any assessments you needed to have completed. It makes perfect sense. So another reason why I bring up the, the actual process is just to show that CSC works really hard to, to help determine whether or not a, an offender is a suitable candidate for parole. And I do want to say, you know, when, when he testified at committee, I, I have a copy of the testimony here, um, he said on the record, as always, public safety is our paramount consideration. So this isn't just a, a, you know, we submit an application online, it goes into a black box and comes out yay or nay. Uh, this is a, a lengthy process, it's a, it's a detailed and thoughtful process, and as always, like he said, public safety is our paramount consideration. He went on to say, the offenders in our care come from all communities across this country, and most will return there. It is the job of Correctional Service of Canada uh, to manage their sentence from day to day, from the day they enter our facility, through their incarceration, and out into the community. And we do so with a constant eye to achieving good correctional results for Canada and Canadians. And when, when you hear about the process, um, you think, well, this is achieving good res um, correctional results for Canada and Canadians. And when you hear about why the Faint Hope Clause exists and the, and the benefits that it can give to the prison population as a whole, as well as to our workers in prisons, it makes good sense. It achieves good correctional results for Canada and Canadians, and it's, it's sound policy. Mr. Speaker, in 2005, um, Guy, sorry, I think it's Bourg Bourgon, from Corrections Research, he prepared a document on average time incarcerated for first degree murder convictions. And, and in preparing this document, he asked the question, how long, in comparison to other countries, do offenders sentenced to first degree murder in Canada spend incarcerated? And I think that's a really great question, because clearly if we have this piece of legislation, S6, if the government's introducing it, then they must think that something is wrong, right? Something must be broken. So, Great question. Maybe, maybe the case is that in Canada, you know, we're letting people out way too early and other, other countries, offenders are staying in prison much longer. I, I think it's a good question to explore. And so I'll actually um, flip to the answer that he discovered. So this, uh, he looked at some, sorry, this went to committee from uh, Mr. Sapers, and so uh, the first part that he actually, um, Andrew, he, he looks at some um, research by Andrew Harris, sorry, in 1999 and found that in Canada, um, the Accountability and Performance Measurement Sector of Correctional Services Canada, so they reported that offenders serving time for first degree murder conviction spent on average 28.4 years incarcerated. In contrast, surveying 16 other countries around the world, for the same first degree murder or its equivalent and who were eligible for release, so those who, who uh, were sentenced to death or offenders uh, who were sentenced to life were excluded, uh, life without parole. So they spent an average of 14.3 years incarcerated. Only Japan, Austria and the US had offenders serving life sentences without parole um, in the reported averages of 20 years or longer. So it's not even like we are way behind the pack with the rest of the world when it comes to sentencing for first degree murder. And in fact, Japan, it was 21.5, Austria, 20 years, and the USA, 29 years. We're at 28.4, right? We're behind the USA by just a few months. It's, it's crazy when you think about it that way. So we know that we're not, uh, you know, we're not wildly out of sync with other countries around the world um, when it comes to our sentencing provisions. We know that this is something that works. It keeps, uh, it keeps our workers safe in prisons. It keeps people, um, it encourages people, uh, gives them incentives to actually try and rehabilitate, and it keeps our community safer in the long run. So I urge all members of this House, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to reject what it is that Bill, C6, or Bill S6 is trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for an excellent uh, speech on, on Bill S6. And I think her, her uh, commentary 
about the uh, the letter written by uh, Newt Gingrich and Pat Nolan certainly uh, requires uh, reading. I should be required reading here for all members of this house, particularly those on the uh, on the government side, because here you have. Um, you know, I, I, when I read this over, I thought Newt Gingrich was stealing my speeches because, I mean, we're, we're practically in lockstep. I never thought I would ever see the day when that would happen. But, you know, if, if anybody reads this, this speech over, you would see that, that he's taking a realistic approach to the problem. He's, he's crossing party lines here and he's working with Democrats at, to arrive at, 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 at best practices which we should all be trying to achieve in any aspect of, of spending public money. We should be looking at what works and, and best practices, and that's what they're doing here. They've, they've realized that 25 years of three strikes and you're out after Reagan has not worked. The jails are full of people and the crime rate's going up. So they know that this hasn't worked. Now they're looking at base, best case scenarios here and they're reducing the prison populations in many states, reducing the costs, and they're getting results. That's what we should be doing here. It's painfully obvious. And the member for Tamistaming is, is very upset that he's lost the Liberals. Well, the Liberals are looking at short-term gain. They're worried about the election in a couple of months, and they're going to follow the Conservatives to eliminate this bill. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. When all the evidence south of the border says we should be looking at it in a different light. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Halifax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I share the member's uh, amazement <laughs> with the Newt Gingrich piece because it's, it makes perfect sense, right? Um, when, when we're at committee and we hear testimony about what works and what doesn't work, often we know what doesn't work because we actually look at um, we look at the lived experience in the U.S. I mean, they've they've done everything wrong, uh, or the certain states have done everything wrong on different issues, and it's it's useful, I suppose, because we can look to it to say, no, it doesn't work. Uh, no, in fact, crime rates don't go down. Um, no, in fact, uh, it doesn't make sense. There is an increased rehabilitation, but the faint hope clause does encourage rehabilitation. I. I that's what we're here for, right? And when I when I think about the some of my colleagues in, in the Liberal Party who are you know going to support S six because it's the political uh, it's the political thing to do, it breaks my heart because it, we live in a just society, right? The great just society. Um, and but this is an unjust bill. It's absolutely unjust. And I think about. Um, Gandhi, if I can say, uh, who said, uh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. What we're doing here is just punishing for punishment's sake. It doesn't make good sense, and it's unjust. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Elmo Transcona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And when, when you consider that uh, at the end of the day, through this long, rig rigorous process that must be followed, only one or two percent would ever get out under the system. but 100% of the prisoners would potentially behave themselves because of the belief that they might be eventually one of that 1 or 2%. Seems to me that that's a small price to pay for giving these people some sort of hope so that they will engage in rehabilitation, which is what we want them to do. They will stay out of trouble, which is what we want them to do. We want to make sure that these prisoners are not a danger to other people in the prison and a danger to the guards. I see nothing wrong with the idea that somehow 100% of the prisoners will do the right thing, rehabilitate themselves, they will behave themselves in the hope that they may be that one, that 1% 1 that gets out at the end of the day. And that's obviously what the, the uh, member for Winnipeg's Norse uh, for, uh, former leader, uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau, was thinking of when, when this legislation was dealt with. But for short-term expediency, these Liberals have jumped on and followed the Conservative bandwagon in fear. And they should be looking at what is going on in other parts of the world, like the United States and Newt Gingrich. I think it's a pretty interesting case when the Newt Gingrich and the NDP are aligned. And the Liberals, not surprisingly, of course, are following Conservatives on this particular issue. The Honourable Member for Halifax. 
Thank you, and I thank the member from Elmwood Transcona for his intervention. Uh, he, he's been here uh, throughout the whole debate. He knows a lot about this issue. He's very passionate about it. Uh, one thing that we forget is that in Canada, a life sentence is a life sentence. It's a sentence for life. And even those offenders who are released into the community after they've served their time in prison, well, they're sentenced, or so, sorry, not sentenced, they're supervised. They're supervised until their time of their death. They are, it's a life sentence. Um, and when it comes to the prison time served, the average time served in prison for first degree murder in Canada is 28.4 years. And that's one of the longest average times in the world. In comparison, the US average time incarcerated is 23 years. And in, in, in New Zealand, Scotland, Switzerland, England, the average time spent is under 15 years. So, so we're taking it seriously in Canada, but there are so many good public policy reasons, so many sound public policy reasons for keeping the faint hope clause. Um, and, and we do have to remember history here, right? We do have to remember the past. The faint hope clause was tied to the abolition of capital punishment and the concept that, that if individual, that individual, uh, um, Offenders are capable of change. They are capable of change and rehabilitation. And it's it's the just thing to do to stand up in this house and to reject this proposition and reject this bill S six. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Alma Transcona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think I'm the next speaker on this uh, bill in any event. So we'll get to some some other issues. But I I would like to to query the the member about how this particular bill fits in with the conservative uh, election strategy here because you know we have a a number of boutique bills that you know cover issues that are already covered under the criminal code matter of fact the the whole issue should be for us to revamp the entire criminal code but that is not something that they want to be in, engaged in we had a situation recently where where the Conservatives discovered that Clifford Olson was receiving an, a, an old age pension, right, in, 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 in prison. And they acted immediately to bring in legislation. Well, we started looking at this and say, well, you know, who and when did, who started sending pension checks to federal prisoners in the first place? And we look back and we find that it was none other than Joe Clark's Conservative government in, I believe it is 19... 79, I get, I've had the date wrong a couple of times already, so I just want to make sure that I'm correct on that. But silence from the Conservatives, because they would never want to admit to their base that they were the ones that brought in the legislation. Don Mazankowski and other Conservatives were licking stamps, putting them on envelopes, mailing, mailing pension checks to prisoners. They're the people that started it, but they want to pretend that, no, that had to be some sort of a liberal conspiracy. Well, that's one they couldn't pin on the liberals. But I haven't heard a liberal stand up yet and try to, re try to make that point, that it was the Conservatives who started this process. And, you know, give them credit, they, they're helping correct it, but they should take responsibility for starting something that they shouldn't have started in the first place. Uh, the Honourable Member for Halifax, a short answer, please. Yes, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, the uh, I don't really have much to add to the member from Elmwood Transcona. I think he he said it beautifully. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh,